Well, again, welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is David Murphy. I'm the founder and CEO of TechFire. I'm so uh, grateful to have you joining us today, whether you're watching live today or watching the recording of this. Uh, we are just delighted to be exploring a topic that unfortunately is uh, a little bit too close to home, I'm sure, for many of you watching today. Uh, uh, it is, of course, an unprecedented year and uh, one that comes with new challenges every day, it seems like. I uh, just have to open the door and uh, <laughs> look outside at the wildfires to see the latest of it. Certainly, that's not what we had in mind with, with tech fire that every day would seem like a fire drill. But, uh, you know, we're so lucky to have with us today uh, a wonderful group of panelists to help guide us through these trying times. And I'm just so grateful uh, to uh, have all of them here. I want to give a special shout out to uh, Jim uh, Baer, uh, who's going to be moderating today, and his firm, CMBG Advisors, uh, as well as uh, Patrick Anding uh, of DLA Piper. Uh, both of them are presenting sponsors, and this event would uh, not have come together without their inspiration and all their incredible hard work in putting this together. Of course, uh, my deepest thanks to all of our speakers. We have an incredible lineup today uh, joining us uh, from uh, LA to Chicago. And uh, of course, uh, <laughs> just want to say uh, before we get started, uh, we're rooting for, for everyone uh, who might be watching this, whether you're riding high like many are in the tech world right now, or whether you're at Doom's door with uh, $600 left in the bank account or, or less. Uh, just know that, uh, you know, we're all certainly in this together. And uh, I do hope that, that you find uh, uh, this program to be helpful as you strategize about next steps. Uh, so I just want to give a, a quick overview uh, of, of our uh, sponsors here today. Uh, CB, CMBG Advisors, uh, again, deepest thanks to Jim and, and also to Caitlin and the entire team there. Uh, they're uh, the firm that you want to call when uh, you know you you do see that things are not going the way you might have hoped they were when you started your company. Uh, you know, rest assured, uh, there is help out there, uh, as you'll see uh, from the program today. You know, uh, you want to uh, give an you know a, an email to Jim at cmbginc.com uh, and uh, and you know get some one-on-one -on -one advice. Uh, you know, but they are. Uh, uh, unique, uh, perhaps, in that uh, Jim also is a uh, founding partner uh, at, at his law firm, so he has uh, uh, quite a dual expertise here, both on the strategy side and all the, the legal issues. And let's be honest, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of tricky legal issues to work out, uh, of course, when things do not go the way that, that one wants. So uh, they're based here, uh, as we are, uh, uh, TechFire in, in the Brentwood area of Los Angeles, and but they're ready to, uh, to uh, help your company wherever it might be. So uh, do be sure to uh, check out their website, uh, CMBG Inc. And uh, of course, uh, those of you who've been with us on prior Tech Fire programs will also know Patrick Anding already uh, from DLA Piper. Uh, we're so glad to have uh, the firm also sponsoring today. They are, of course, uh, a premier global law firm uh, with uh, more than 200 uh, partners in their tech uh, emerging growth venture capital practice alone. They have some wonderful tools available, whether you're on the startup side, uh, DLA Piper Accelerate as a resource, uh, or you're uh, you know, at the phase where you're exploring legal options uh, to you know, hopefully raise that next round or <laughs> if things uh, are not looking good, you know, to review uh, what your fiduciary duties are and, and uh, what your next steps uh, could be uh, when, uh, when things are, are looking down. So, uh, Patrick um, has, of course, moderated many of our events uh, over the years. We're so honored to have him as a panelist today and get to hear uh, from him uh, and his expertise directly. And speaking of panelists, uh, we have uh, just a wonderful group here. Uh, those of you who joined us last year for our uh, Pitch Fest will recognize Jesse Draper, who keynoted. Uh, Jesse, thanks so much for coming back today. Um, she is, uh, of course, uh, the founding partner of Hologen. Uh, uh, does uh, venture investing with a particular focus on female founders uh, and also uh, comes actually with a moderator hat used to used to host uh, many events many of you know her from uh, the Valley Girl show where she uh, interviewed uh, you know a lot of the, the tech uh, giants of Silicon Valley and beyond um, and uh, she is uh, someone who's been named uh, as one of the most 50 50 most connected women in America um, and uh, has quite a portfolio, uh, of course, with Holland Ventures, and I'm sure some of you 
on this call are hoping to add to that portfolio. <laughs> and so we'll make sure she has a chance to talk about her, her investing focus. Uh, and Matt McCall joins us uh, from Pritzker Group Venture Capital. Uh, Matt is a partner there. Um, and of course, Pritzker Group uh, uh, has been a, a real force uh, both in LA and in Illinois uh, for, for going back, uh, you know, so many years. Uh, and Matt himself uh, has been named uh, to, you know, 40 under 40 lists, uh, builds quite a portfolio, uh, you know, uh, with many, many exits. Uh, I'm sure he'll tell us maybe some of the companies that maybe won't name any names, but that, that were not, uh, you know, uh, on this list of portfolio companies uh, that where things didn't always go as, as well as one helps, but, uh, but you know, uh, quite, quite an impressive portfolio of big successes. Uh, too. So, uh, Pritzker Group, uh, you know, is, is another big force uh, on the VC world. We're so honored to have you, Matt, uh, join us. We're wanting to have you for a while. So, uh, pretty shortly here, I'm going to turn things over uh, to Jim uh, Bayer to uh, to uh, uh, take over the moderator uh, hat here. But I just want to thank uh, uh, Jim for uh, all you're doing to, uh, you know, uh, uh, make sure that uh, all of us survive this crazy year and get out the other side. So without any further ado, go for it, Jim. Well, thank you, David, for the kind remarks and welcome everybody. We, uh, we're gonna try to do this as informally as we can. And especially in this time of COVID and a lot of Zoom meetings, I, I know I've sat through some that have been insufferable, but we're gonna try to make this interactive. You have the chat box and please chat questions to me and you can ask if, if there's one of our panelists you want to direct a particular question to, feel free to do that. I'll try to get to all of you. If I don't, as David said in the beginning, you can email any of us with your questions and we'll try to get back to you. Um, but again, welcome. And what we're going to do to kick this off is we're going to start with two approaches here. One is when you're hitting some troubled waters, what can you do to navigate those waters and essentially make your burn last longer than other things. So we're gonna turn to the panelists and ask them for some practical examples of what they would counsel companies that are quote, struggling in this environment. And then we're gonna, at the end, maybe talk about some hypotheticals or other situations where if you really do have a liquidity problem and you have to restructure either out of court or through a bankruptcy or through an assignment for the benefit of creditors, kind of how do you do that in a win-win way where it's not seen as a tragedy, but it's seen as using a tool to help you get to the next level. And whether or not that's restructuring or restarting your company it, or selling it, because you may be selling it, leaving the assets or the liabilities behind. All of us have been through similar situations like that. And I think the message of today in the COVID world is you're not alone. We're all fearful. We're all struggling with things. We've all got some successes and a lot to be grateful for, but whether or not you're a Democrat or you're Republican, we're all feeling a little stress right now. So, with no further ado, what I'd like to do is, is start by turning over to Jesse and, and Matt, and then Patrick, you can jump in from a legal perspective. But Matt, you, you and Jesse, you get calls from, from your portfolio companies, and you've been through these kind of troubled waters. What would you suggest companies do and entrepreneurs do that are struggling in this environment? Sure. Jesse, you want to start? Um, sure. I was going to let you start, but yes, sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having all of us. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, love TechFire so much. You throw incredible events, and I'm grateful to still be able to participate through Zoom. Um, but yeah, this has been, uh, COVID's been crazy for everybody, and I hope everyone is doing okay and healthy, um, obviously, with all the um, fires, etc. cetera. Um, just, you know, the Armageddon that's going on outside all of our doors. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in terms of what we recommend our companies do, in the beginning of COVID, um, we got on the phone with all 62 of our portfolio companies. And I think in early stage, you see before anyone else kind of like what's happening. Um, you have, I felt like I was the psychic and I could see the future and no one else could see it because it hadn't hit the larger companies yet in terms of what you know, our company is taking hits to revenue and things like that. And so one of the, the first pieces of advice we gave our companies is, you know, make sure you have enough runway, figure out how to get to 18 to 24 months, um, you know, cut anything unnecessary, um, you know, in consumer that typically starts with marketing spend, uh, be thoughtful about working capital. But most importantly, I, I would just say, 
do something, <laughs> do something. You know, if you are in a business that has a retail storefront, you should be just trying every magic trick you can pull out of a hat. Um, I think in our portfolio, the companies, the handful of companies I was concerned about were the ones who were saying, we're just going to sit here and we're just going to, um, you know, sort of wait it out. And I'm like, well, just, I don't care if you do something stupid, like try to do something. Um, and then in other ways, we watched our portfolio companies, you know, move entire businesses online in a matter of weeks, um, launch new products. And I would just say, get as creative as you can. This is the real test of an entrepreneur. And that's why we throw out the buzzword pivot so often. <laughs> um, I think as a VC, you're looking for the founders who can pivot and be thoughtful about um, not just going in one direction. Um, I used to joke about uh, when I was interviewing entrepreneurs or taking their first pitch, I'd, I'd always sort of say something, throw them a curveball, and I'd say like, what if there was like uh, an international pandemic? And I really would use examples like that. And now I think our founders are fantastic because they, they think outside of the box. And that really is something you have to do as a founder. But this is your moment. We're in a real crazy time and entrepreneurs are who are going to pull us out of this. You're going to solve all the problems that we're having right now. So I look forward to seeing pitches from all you out there right now. Thanks, Jesse. Matt, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, so, you know, the first thing I would say is, as, as Jesse talked about, when, when you have a, a crisis like this, I always call it the Venture Employment Act. This is where all of the new models come up. So as an entrepreneur, if you can self-manage your own fear and anxiety, what will open up is suddenly you realize that there are entire swaths of opportunity, the what ifs that, that Jesse was talking about, that didn't exist before, right? So the first thing is just realize that usually these crises net net, if you can survive them, are exponentially net positive for startups, not so good for incumbents. Um, second, take the rose colored glasses off, as she said, you know, manage the downside, let the upside take care of itself. And, and this is one thing we tell our, our entrepreneurs. A, a great example of this, and I won't talk now, but listen to the Tim Ferriss interview of Nick Kakonis. It's one of our companies at Talk, which uh, is a competitor to Open Table. And I swear to God, I thought they were toast. He pivoted the business, he saw the issue happening in Hong Kong, figured it was coming to the US. And by the end of February, had pivoted and completely redesigned their platform, and he doubled revenue. If he hadn't, he and he did an up round right after that. If he hadn't, he would have been roadkill. Um, but it's probably one of the top Ferris interviews, so de definitely listen to that. Um, what is your job as a CEO? Your job as a CEO is really simple. Uh, Harry Kramer, who, who teaches values-based leadership at Kellogg and was the Baxter. CEO said, you have basically two or three main jobs as a leader. Number one, set the vision. So when, when everything hits the fan, your job is to double down on what's our vision, what are our values, what are we gonna focus on and be clear and then start taking really small actions. Actions conquer anxiety at the end of the day. Also, the second thing is you are the key communicator. So everyone is going to be freaking out. Your job is to frequently be telling them what is going on, what we're doing, and also more importantly, what you don't know, but how you are going to try and figure it out versus just trying to paint everything as rosy. Bring them under the tent or they will fill in, in themselves and it will usually be much worse. Um, as uh, Jesse also said, we, tar we, we went, sat down with all of our companies and said, you gotta get 18 to 24 months here, let's figure out what to do. Um, and we kept coming back and going, go more, go more, go more. And what happens is they'll say, we can't do any more, we can't cut any more, and we'll say, great, perfect, cut another 20%. And they do it, and then it turns out that guess what? Lo and behold, their margins look better when things come back around, they actually were able to get what they needed to get done. So furloughs, rent abatements, cutting expenses, customer prepays, go to your customers, get them to prepay or defer the bills, um, and throughout all of this, it's really important that you keep your investors up to speed. So not only do you need to communicate 
there's a natural tendency for you to say, oh crap, I don't want anyone to see anything that's going on. Um, just the opposite. You want to communicate with them, but also you have to be, in many ways, even though it's going to be tough, the key cheerleader of this company, right? The energy force that drives, you know, drives coming forward. So keep your investors up to speed and the loop. Tell them what's happening. Tell them what might be happening. They are your most likely source of capital. And you'll probably to get that extra, you know, six months, seven months might need to put a bridge in place. Um, and then I'll we can talk a little bit later about how do you do fundraising and stuff like that. But it's a really clear model um, that, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years now. Actually, I started with Jesse's dad way back when at Draper. So, um, you know, it's not rocket science. We have one of these about every 10 years. And uh, it net net, it's usually very good for our world. But you just got to make sure you manage the downside and let the upside take care of itself. Well, and so uh, to play back what I think Jesse and you both stressed, you said one, take action, y you got to move. And, and I also think you're saying that a leader has to not bury the facts. But if there's a if there's bad news, if there's Tylenol on the shelf that needs to get pulled, be a communicator, come out front. If, if your investors and your board are nervous, but you come to them with a plan and you say, hey, it's not, a, it's not a crisis, it's a challenge, here's the potential solution, and you realize you're part of a team, it sounds like Matt and Jesse, you'll jump in and help them, but they have to come to you and at least ask for help and have the courage to do it. So, so Patrick, based on what you're hearing, when you are counseling companies that are trying to accomplish what Jesse and Matt are outlining, what, what kind of legal challenges and solutions do you see in these, in these areas? Well, that's a great question. And I think, as, so generally my role, right, is the, the kind of first point of contact, typically for the CFO or CEO. Those are the, the folks of the company I speak to regularly. So when I get involved, um, I, I'm getting involved at a point in time where a company is trying to figure out what to do. And my general, I mean, I mean there's kind of a couple uh, things that you guys have already pointed to is, as a as a CEO, you know, you always want more time um, to execute your plan. So runway is obviously critical. And so CEO starts making decisions or, and doing analysis about how to 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 bridge, you know, and not not bridge and bridge financing, but bridge the pandemic or bridge this this you know, black swan event. And and my first kind of direction to them is, listen, you don't want to do this by yourself. You need to deal, work with your board. You need to have a process by which you do this analysis. Um, and I have companies that uh, don't necessarily think that way. They think, hey, I'm the CEO. This is my ship. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the decisions. I need to answer all these solutions. And they lock themselves you know, in a room and try to come up with a plan. And, and my general view is, you know, from, I think, for, from a, like a spiritual, psychological aspect, it's a bad, a bad idea. You have a lot of people on your side. You should work with the people who are gonna root for you, your investors who've got a lot at stake, your board who is there to help you with these decisions, um, just so you don't have to bear all this on your shoulders yourself. And then secondarily, from a legal perspective, you know, the CEO obviously reports to the board and the board reports to the stockholders. So the CEO wants to make sure their board is in the loop on all these decisions. And, and, and I think most importantly, the board has the data to analyze these decisions and give input and sign off on them. I, I really dissuade my CEOs and CFOs from making pivotal decisions in a company in times of stress that are gonna have long-term uh, long effects on the outcome of the business without buy-in from, from the board. And for the board to make those decisions, I'm sure Jesse and Matt, you, you two serve on many boards, what you need is information and you need information and you need discussion. So I think to what everyone is saying, Jim and, and, and Matt and Jesse, you got to go to the stakeholders. You need to have open communication. You need to know you're not in this by yourself. Um, even though maybe your vision as a CEO is your plan, it's your idea. You've got folks there who have your back and also have a lot of skills around you. So my, my kind of first kind of direction is figure out a process, right? You, you built a business, you modeled out a bunch of financial projections. You've got like a marketing plan and a business plan. And now if you need to change that, okay, how am I going to change that? You know, what data do I need? Who are my stakeholders? What buy-in do I need to get from my CTO, my marketing people? Uh, I need to get my board the right information so they can, then they can sign off on, on whatever these pivots are gonna be. And, and think about it from a process perspective. Um, and uh, like I said, you all, everyone needs more time. 
So that process needs to align up with what you think your runway is, what you think your, you know, your projections are for whatever this, the, in this case, a global pandemic, because I know we're, we're in the middle of it. Um, and it's, and it's, so it's about data and analysis and process. I think that's, that's kind of my, at a high level um, direction I give to most of the companies I speak to. And I speak to them all the time. Literally two hours before this was on a, on a phone call with a, a CEO who's negotiating between his board, his investors, and his creditors. And, and he's trying to, to you know, bridge the gap between funding and insolvency. And it's very much about process and getting your stakeholders at the table, getting everyone the information they need um, so everyone can make decisions in an informed way. Patrick, thank you. So in, in this challenging time and, and having these processes, and now, for instance, all of us doing what we're doing on Zoom, one of the questions we had from the audience was, if you're trying to get that financing put together and you're halfway there, and you've got a product that may even be great in COVID, and you might be able to get it out in time, you might not, but you'd like to. What have we seen people do creatively to get people's attention from a fundraising perspective when you're not doing a lot of personal lunches? I, I can tell you, I know somebody in a technology company that when they're trying to get meetings with people now are sending them like milk and cookies by messengers or you know, a, a, a delivery of, of, of lunch or something. But, but if I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm trying to get your attention, and, and, and this time, Jesse, let's start with you, and I'm, I'm trying to get your attention, how, how do I stand out in this time? Um, I think you, um, you know, you pitch me <laughs> as usual, but like what, what has gotten my attention is recently some of the companies I had passed on previously, um, they'll, you know, you don't always say yes as an investor the first time. I, I actually really like to see progress. And so to um, come back to anyone you've talked to who, I think those are your first, I'm not saying you're not gonna get a new check, but those are your first, those should be your first targets, people you've already spoken with um, because you've already had a connect and we're still getting used to this Zoom opportunity right now um, and to show that you've made progress. So to come and say, you know, uh, hey, here's what I've been doing since I talked to you. Here's how we addressed COVID. We're actually profitable now. We cut our uh, burn. Um, those are very interesting to me. And then we've been taking a lot of new pitches now, more recently as well. Um, and I think we're looking for different things now. You know, VCs, you should always be thinking uh, when you're trying to put, you know, put yourself in our shoes. And we're now looking at the next 10 years in a totally different way. So come at us with a business proposal that is um, going to be the next billion dollar business of the future. If you look at the 2008 recession, all of the biggest tech companies you know today came out of that one. Um, and so, you know, prove to us that you're going to be the next biggest technology company um, starting now. So we're, you know, we weren't looking as seriously at ed tech. Now we're looking uh, very seriously at ed tech. We're looking, we were, we're looking much more seriously at work from home technologies. We have a great company called Squad that's like a Zoom for teenagers. Um, and I think we're looking for things that will be the next billion dollar business and solve all of these problems today uh, for the future. That, that's helpful. So Matt, what about creative things or, or suggestions you'd have to people in this COVID environment? Yeah. Well, see, I don't know if, <clears throat> I, I don't know if at the end of the day, it's something that is, uh, you know, an, an interesting trick to grab people's attention. I think people are kind of moved down Maslow's hierarchy at this point, which is, um, do you know your unit economics? What are the scale levers on your business? And what's your story? Like, why am I excited to lean in on this at the end of the day? And so if I was to kind of just summarize it in one sentence, you know, entrepreneurship and venture is very simple. It's simply P times Q, price times quantity times a margin, right? And so you have to show, um, and so most VCs will say, please show me that you got one customer and how much do you make off that customer in terms of price? What was the margin? What are the unit economics? And then what are the channels or the Q you're going to go after to scale the business? You know, and, and to Jesse's point earlier about making progress, that is what is most impressive. If you're in COVID um, and you're somehow able to scale your business, add new customers, 
that catches people's attention at the end of the day. And that's a lot of noodles up against the wall. So, um, and then I would say, um, it's also the storytelling. What's your origin story? What's your, what's your reason for doing what you're doing? Let them see the energy behind what's going on here and show them how gritty you are at the end of the day, um, that you, know, you view this as an opportunity. And then last but not least is I probably accelerate strategic discussions. The strategics are still funding these days, right? Either prepays or things like that, but they're also investing in companies. Um, and it, you, know, you can always have those strategic discussions because these are the people who likely will buy you at the end of the day anyways. So there are a lot of ways to do that. But it's, it's not that difficult to do the, you know, the unit economics, the scale levers, all of that. It's how you craft in the story that's the art at the end of the day. Okay. And this is David. I just want to jump in and uh, remind everyone who's watching, keep those questions coming to uh, keep uh, getting to more at the end as well. Uh, use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Thank yeah, you. Th thanks. Because, and as, as questions come in, I'm going to, I'll try to address them, but it's, it's, it's hard for me to, um, and my headset just went, can you? Oh, you just muted. I uh, know, no, my headset. Oh. Uh, can everybody hear me now? Yep. Okay, good. Yep. So some questions are starting to come in, but it's harder for me to read them and address you at the same time. So one of the things we can do while I'm looking at the questions is let me, let me throw out a real life situation where there's no right answer, but where a, a company that could be in your portfolio or, or, or one that's pitching you has like a communal kitchen. So there, there, there's one in Brooklyn, there's one in LA, there's one in Dallas. They've got these beautiful kitchens they've built out for a half million dollars each. They've got some bank financing in place. They've got some VCs behind them and some angel investors. So they're in different states. They've got these communal kitchens. And, and entrepreneurs come in and they start their businesses and they do their communal cooking. Well, it's going gangbusters. And then all of a sudden COVID hits, they get a PPP loan. They spend it. They keep their kind of, they're, they're, it's not a heavy, there's not a lot of employees in the business. There's some, but they've got a lot of leases that they're behind on. Now they've been given, um, you know, forbearance. So they haven't had to pay those lease payments, but now the bank's saying, Hey, you've been missing some payments you're out of covenant. What's your plan to kind of get us current? Oh, by the way, you got these six facilities and they're, they're all, you know, not doing so well. You're doing some takeout, but you're behind on your leases. So they, so they take Jesse's and Matt's advice. They say, Hey, listen, we're going to communicate with you and we're going to do something. And the first thing we're doing is we're calling you up and saying, Hey, Hey, help. What do we do? What, what as throwing that out to you, and Patrick, I'll start with you as a lawyer from your perspective, what do you tell them in that situation? Hmm. Well, that's a tough situation. Um, I, I mean, listen, I think if the premise, if I understand the question correctly, this is a business that's based on communal kitchens and renting kitchen space. Um, and, and is that right, Jim? Yeah. So Not like a this, very specific, maybe real problem that you've just described. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I, that, that's tough. So there, there are a lot of business aspects of that that I probably am not the best person to analyze. So, so going to back to my first point of getting your stakeholders involved, like your board, um, and, 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 and thinking about what you may be able to do with these assets going forward is probably your first step. And if, if you literally are renting communal kitchen space in this environment and wondering when folks would feel safe enough to come back to go work in these communal kitchens, my sense is... Um, without having much domain expertise in that business is you're going to need to pivot to use those assets in some other way and do it pretty, rap pretty rapidly. Um, so without a plan on the business side, you know, with, with respect to dealing with your creditors, uh, I, I think you're going to have a hard time dealing with your creditors without some, some sort of story to them about what you're going to do with these assets. And if your creditors are sitting there thinking, you've got a business that's going to be shut down for the next year, you owe us a bunch of money, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think you're going to get a lot of love from them. That being said, I'll say two things I know that are true. And Jim, I think, especially on your side of the, of the world, you see this all the time. And I think Matt and Jesse would agree. Typically, a lot of these venture creditors, these venture banks are not in the business of owning or operating assets. That's not really what they do. Uh, I sat on a panel once with 
people from SVB and, 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 and I was moderating and asked them, I'm like, hey, kind of describe the situation like that. You're SVB, your company's not going to make payments on this credit line. You're worried about the business. Are you really going to foreclose on the assets and go take over this business? And the answer was like, not really. That's not what we really do. So you, you dealing with creditors often can get more time just by asking. Um, because I don't think a bank wants and, and a lender wants wants a bunch of communal kitchens, and they're not really interested in trying to sell a bunch of whatever the the machine, you know the knives and the cooking apparatuses are, or, or taking over these leases. So I would say this is this is where that process comes to place. You need to think about how you're going to pivot to use these assets, and then once you have that story together, then you can start dealing with your creditors with a new business model to figure out how to buy more time to give them the best chance to get their money back. And, and often that's the argument, right? Is, hey, I've got a new plan. I owe you a bunch of money. You could foreclose and get $0, or you can give me a chance to execute and maybe get all your money back, maybe get 70 cents on the dollar, or maybe get a lot of upside. But that story and that plan is gonna be what you have to go sell again. To, so it's almost like starting a new business in some sense. So, so let's, let's, let's pick up on that for a second. I wanna to go to Matt and Jesse on this. So in 2008 and 2009, when we had a big recession, I remember there was a company called Baby Style that had like 11 locations and we talked about doing an out of court restructuring and we went to the landlords and they, we got no relief. So we had to file bankruptcy because we had to use bankruptcy as a tool to renegotiate those leases. Now mm -hmm. I'm seeing something a little different and this is how I'm gonna lead into my question to Jesse and, and Matt is let's use this communal kitchen. Let's say this is really happening today. We liquidated a company like this a year ago, two years ago but today, I think we could save that company, and I'll tell you why. Landlords don't want space back right now. Mm -hmm. If Jesse and Matt are the investors in these businesses, they don't want to put in good money right now. They don't. The landlord doesn't want to have an empty space right now, and the bank doesn't really want to write off. If I came to Jesse and Matt and I said, hey, guys, listen, I am trying to renegotiate with my landlords. They all want me out of here. And I'm telling them, look, you, you can go try to find a tenant, but if, if when COVID starts to come back and we get out of this, we've got investors ready and willing to reinvest, but they need to know that you're willing to partner with us. How would you, Jesse or Matt, deal with that hypothetical? So, so I guess I would do two things. One is the landlords are playing ball a little bit more this time around because the banks are, are telling them to at the end of the day. Um, as soon as that changes, the landlords are going to go right back to, pardon my French for being assholes. Um, the, the, the thing that they're going to look for is, is there a credible business here at the end of the day, a reason for believing, and are the existing investors willing to put more money into the company to show support, right? So that's generally kind of how they're going to play this. So you, number one is you've got to, so the first thing you need to do, going back to Patrick's suggestion is, how do you do the pivot, right? I mean, that's the, the, and what I would say is you've got to go back to actually have a partner. This is all he does. He was at IDEO before. Um, he's got to do a jobs to be done analysis. At the end of the day, someone is buying your product to make progress. Actually, they're borrowing your product or service to make progress in their life. So in the kitchen case, people are either doing it because they want communal connection. They want to be fed that, you know, something along those lines. You have to then put constraints. That's where creativity comes in. You have to put constraints around and say, all right, if our job is to feed these people, how can we pivot? How can we change this and make money? And this is what Talk did. If you listen to the interview with Tim Ferriss, what they did is they took all of the restaurants, they turned them into manufacturing facilities for food, and then they created a software layer in which you could do Uber Eats like ordering on their own website and use their bus boys to deliver the food, right? They're still doing the same job, which was feeding people, right? right? And being it responsible. It just was not in that context. So you've got to literally blow up the actual context of what you're doing and understand what your job to be done is and change it. Once you've done that, then you can say, okay, what's our story we want to tell our landlords, right? Show them a model. Go to existing invest and say, if we were able to get concessions from the landlord, would you be willing to put a little bit more money in as a sign of good faith? And you go from there. If you don't do that first part, the part that Patrick's talking about, a lot of them are just going to say, I, I, we've given you the opportunity here. Sorry, 
we're going to, you know, just have to foreclose. And, okay. and Matt, one thing I'll add, and it picks up on something Jesse said earlier, is the basis of that is understanding the assets that you have. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a bunch of kitchens and you're going to repurpose them for, you know, industrial cooking or manufacturing, understanding those assets and how to reuse them is kind of your first step. So Jesse, I think you said that earlier on, maybe in mm -hmm. discussion before this about one of your clients of got to know what you have and and figure out how to how to reutilize them so maybe your customers change but your assets find new customers yeah and you're you know that's a great thing i think for founders to just do in general especially right now you know assess what you have what are your assets is it your customers do you have patents or any kind of ip um you know what kind of revenue do you still have um what what technology uh, is interesting that you could potentially sell? Um, because I think that that's something you should just always have in the back of your head um, in terms of like if you for some reason had to do an asset sale, um, worst case scenario, it's good to just know what's valuable. So, and Jesse, are you finding, again, Matt, Matt's point about landlords are going to go back to not being easy to deal with. Are you sensing any more? <laughs> I'm like, don't ask me about the landlords. I'm terrified of anything that touches real estate. So, <laughs> but that was before COVID. Um, but that was because I had a deal go bad in this space like seven years ago that was called Move Loot. And you would know, it was like one of the first things where you took a, um, you take a picture of a piece of furniture and they come and pick it up and store it in a warehouse and then sell it. And you guys already can tell the issue with this um, particular company, but they couldn't turn over the, the furniture quick enough. So they have all these long, giant warehouses, long leases on giant warehouse space. And then the company basically just imploded. And that was the last time I invested in anything without a real estate partner. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as the landlords coming to me personally, that's just not the type of investing we do. But like, um, I would definitely reinvest if the founder came to me with something really creative, um, like, like what Matt had mentioned his company did. Okay, so and are you seeing, in terms of companies that are trying to reposition themselves, are there legal issues? Like, for instance, what do you do to a company that's got um, 100 employees, for instance, and because of the Warren Act, you want to furlough some people, but for sake of, and you want to hire them back. But if you furlough in California, at least, have you now violated the Warren Act and the 60 day requirement? Or, Patrick, is there an exception that applies in that situation? <laughs> it's about the Warren Act. <laughs> well, I'm saying, I mean, I'm saying it, let, let's say you're, you, you want to be creative and you want to get through COVID and you've got 100 employees, and you've got this great business, and you go to Jesse, and you go to Matt, and you say, We're, we want, you want us to cut another 20%. Okay, well, we've got some employees that are not doing anything right now, so we're going to lay, well, I'll tell you what, we won't lay them off, we just won't pay them. Is that okay? Um, or, well, we're going to lay them off, but we can hire them back. Is that okay? I mean, if you're dealing with employees, what are the kind of challenges, if any, that you have to deal with if you're, if you're trying to cut your burn with employees? I get good counsel. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, definitely get good counsel. Make sure that that package is ready to go if you need it, and um, uh, that exit pa package. But also, I think you have to look at your team as a founder. You should definitely be looking at your team and saying who is integral to the success of this company. Who am I going to make sure to keep no matter what? I mean, we've seen founders uh, go talk to their employees and say, "Okay, we're all taking a thirty percent." Um, cut to our salary uh you know us we're actually you know usually the founders take even more um but we want you guys to know this is going to be six months and we're going to just power through it and we're going to do the best we can um because i think you know being a founder is you know it's just so important to be a, a great leader and set that tone and show like you're in it for together um, and, and also just be transparent about that. I think there's creative ways to structure that. If you don't need them and they're not doing anything, it probably would behoove you to get rid of them um, and potentially find someone down the road to fill that spot if you needed it. It's a, it's a portfolio. The way we looked at it is as a portfolio of cut the lower 10% that you were gonna cut anyways or whatever it is, 
furlough the ones that are really valuable, but make certain they're taken care of, right? That they got their benefits, there's goodwill, you're really clear about them. And then for everyone else, the third trigger, which is the most important is that what Jesse said is the salary reduction, where you kind of spread it out. You can tell people, I could either fire people or we could all take a reduction. Almost every single situation, they say, let's spread the pain a little bit here. Um, and you can get around these uh, issues. And then there are, you know, then you get the legal counsel in as it relates to the Warren Act and things like that. If you have to do a cut, do you do 15% and then 15%, things like that. No, I think. And Jim, this is David. Can I put you on the spot, Jim? And also Patrick too. We were talking on the uh, prep call about how there's like three different tiers you might want to think about uh, as the timeline is, you know, the clock is ticking towards doomsday. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, some of these employment issues and regulatory issues come up front. Can you expand on that a little bit? Before? Jim, why don't you, you should take that because you talked about your three buckets, which I thought was great yesterday in our prep call. Maybe. Um, I, I don't mean, I, I don't, I don't mean to show my um, lack of memory, but w which specifically yeah. in terms of the, what were my three buckets? Yeah. So what we're talking about, I think is the, 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 the times at which companies need to make decisions. And so, there are going to be along the, the, the kind of horizon of running out of money. And I know we haven't spoken too much about that moment of bankruptcy at this point, but there are, are times at which companies need to make decisions. And when there are stakeholders who are going to get at the short end of the stick, I think is how we were think, thinking about it. So for example, there's your kind of statutory people, the employees who you have to pay, your unsecured creditors who you don't necessarily have to pay and vendors. And I think you had kind of thought about those in three different buckets Three different categories of, of, of essential creditors of people that you'd have to pay and how, those, how that informs the, your kind of timeline. Those are my, I was the one who had the three buckets. Oh, Matt, Matt, you had the three buckets. <laughs> Matt, Matt, by the way, thank Matt, Matt, thank you. Thank you, Matt, thank, Matt, thank, thank, thank you for Back to you, Matt. I have, I, have my kids me, I have my kids giving me a hard enough time when I don't remember something. So I'm thinking, of, oh my God. <laughs> I, I, I should have had another cup of coffee this morning. I've got a pandemic to pay myself. So, 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 so thank you, Matt. And, <laughs> Matt, you, you got the three buckets there. I, my life flashed before my eyes, guys. So just uh, Matt, Matt, the VCs were the first bucket, right? No, <laughs> director, the director payments. Um, yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I just want to see how long Jim could swing on the vine there. Um, that was awesome. <laughs> so look, I think at the end of the day, you know, Don Valentine, the founder of Sequoia said, at the end of the day, all companies die for the same reason. They run out of effing money, right? And it's not really actually that you run out of money, you enter the ins zone of insolvency. So there's a difference between running out of money and being insolvent. Insolvent means, um, and this is where the buckets come in, the, you you want to know, first of all, what is day zero? You want to know to the day, when do you run out of money? And then back forward, everything. And everything you should do is then pushing that out to the 18 to 24 month window that Jesse was talking about. But know to the day when it, you're, you're, not just your cash goes to zero, but before that, you actually have things like uh, uh, statutory expenses, uh, payroll taxes, and things along those lines. Uh, uh, accrued vacation time, things like that, that the feds can actually come after the directors and the executives personally for that stuff. And that's bucket number one, the statutory stuff. And make certain that you, with a good lawyer, you've got your list of, that you're covered on all that stuff. And there are a whole bunch of strategies. The second one are kind of your accounts payable, accounts receivable, things like that, that people, for example, in the subscription business, there's that business where, you know, they took a bunch of uh, things it was involving, you know, brides or something like that. And they just kept running it until it went to zero. And then you had all these brides that couldn't get dresses for their wedding, right? And so you have to say, how do I want to show up in the world of my next chapter? And so it could be that you, 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 people have paid you in advance for things. You know, I'd put that in those buckets because you're going to have to fulfill on those. Um, certain accounts payable, things like that. And then, you know, you've got some other obligations. And so you can kind of tear them into three buckets um, and then create strategies against all of those. But the important thing is when you're managing your business as a CEO, the other key job, in addition to being the vision person and the communication person and the chief cheerleader is you got to know when that zone of insolvency is hit, because that's really at that point when your game's over. It's not when you're out you know, of cash. You know, 
you, Matt. Uh, that, that was spot on. Uh, and I, I want to ask you, Jim, this is really for you. When you do hit all those tiers and things, you know, really are uh, insolvent, can you run folks through who aren't familiar with the range of options from ABCs, you know, bankruptcy, uh, just a kind of a brief overview of what you're seeing most common right now, what needs to be on people's radar screens? Well, yeah, so, so if you're in a situation where you can either raise capital, but you have to clean up your balance sheet, or if you want to sell your assets, because as Jesse or Matt got you to realize there's some valuable assets there, but when you go to your lawyer, the lawyer says, well, the challenge is if you're selling substantially all your assets, the buyer is going to be assuming your liabilities and there's too many liabilities and the buyer doesn't want to assume those liabilities. Or you want to potentially rebuy your business and, and kind of bring it back and essentially leave the, asset, the, the liabilities behind and bring it back. Or you just have to shut down because you tried it and it's just not going to work. So there, there really are a panoply of options. And if you go to a good bankruptcy lawyer or a good corporate lawyer or um, an assignee or restructuring person, and you lay out the options to them or your situation to them, if, if there's leases involved and you need to restructure and you want to keep some leases or you have a valuable uh, agreement with the, a studio for a licensing deal and you want to keep it and you don't want to lose it, you may have to do what's called a Chapter 11, which is a bankruptcy filing. More expensive, but it's kind of the platinum standard. So going back to the three buckets, I, here's my three buckets. If you have to restructure, you have to sell the assets in a way where you need the platinum protection. You want to pick and choose some leases or not to keep. You do a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Advantages, bankruptcy judges are God. They can do anything. Downside, it's expensive and it takes time. Your next option there is you could do what's called an assignment for the benefit of creditors where the assets get transferred in trust to an assignee and they then sell those assets free and clear of the unsecured loan. So if there's a secured lender, you're gonna to need to negotiate with that secured lender or get their consent. But with respect to payables and other unsecured liabilities, you can sell those assets to either a third party, uh, to a venture backed startup, or Jesse or Matt could say, look, you gotta run it through an ABC, but if you're the successful bidder, we'll back the new company. We just need that $5 million of, of legacy debt left behind. So get a stocking horse bid in place, but you've got to market with an ABC or in a 363 bankruptcy. And we can restart or re, uh, you know, structure the business through an ABC. Mm -hmm. You can also do it consensually where those landlords who Matt said are going to be difficult may agree to cut those lease payments. You may get a bank to do a consensual restructuring. So that's an out of court restructuring. And then in your last alternative, you do either a federal chapter seven bankruptcy liquidation or a liquidation through an ABC. And, and here's the advantage or the disadvantages. With a chapter seven liquidation, you need no money. So if you've, got, if you've taken that bank account to zero and your investors are saying, hey, we don't care about the stigma of bankruptcy. We, we're not gonna put another dime into this thing. You're on your own. You can do a chapter seven bankruptcy where you hand the keys over to the bankruptcy trustee and they will then liquidate and shut down the company. If on the other hand, you want it done more discreetly, you want to do it with your um, investors kind of transferring that fiduciary duty to an assignee, you transfer those assets to an assignee, they can liquidate the assets. You can pick the assignee as opposed to that person being court appointed and you can shut down the company in a quiet under the radar type of way. So those are, those are some different alternatives if you're in a situation where you've really run out of equity and you've got to do something. Mm -hmm. You also have a significant leverage at that point. Um, real, real estate guys, other people generally won't move until there's a gun to their head. And uh, you know, the funniest story I think I shared with you guys is I, I, one of my first CEOs on the venture side was a turnaround guy. And when we got to the end game, he took all the accounts payables and he made 30 copies of them. He then got Silicon Valley Bank to say that they were secured and they were going to foreclose and they were going to get nothing. And he put a bolt through them and he hand delivered them to the CEO of every single payable and said, I'll give you 10 cents on the dollar or you can get zero. And we settled all of the accounts payable for 12 cents on the dollar. And so when we sold the company, 
um, you know, at the end of the day, there was a lot more left over. Um, but it's a, it's a, it, you got to end up with a lot of leverage. Hopefully, you don't end up in that scenario, but there's a lot of stuff you can do in the end, at, at the end game there. What's the most common strategy you see, Jim, happening right now? I mean, what's the read on your clients where they are in the market? Um, I, I think, first of all, I'm seeing a lot of people in that are having lease payments coming due that they they have been able to defer, and and they'll 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 ask the question, "What do I do with these lease payments?" And my my first answer is, "Go talk to the landlord," um, because if you don't ask, you don't get. And you may want to do that through a consultant so that they take you seriously. So you, you go to the landlord and you say, look, we can do a bankruptcy or an ABC and you'll get zero. Or do you want to work with us? We'll either peacefully transition the space back to you and help you market it. But we can get new money put in, but we can't do it if we have this legacy lease hanging over our head. So the first thing I'm seeing people do is asking the question, what do we do? Because re remember... However profitable you are, if you haven't been paying your lease for the last three or four months, that, that seems to be the thing that's triggering the most people that I'm seeing right now in terms of, in, I, you've seen a sea change in the last month. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, people are trying to avoid bankruptcy at all costs because it's so expensive. But I, I'm, I'm, ironically, for the last few months, I think we were less busy because in the in the tech world, as I think Jesse and Matt will attest, there, there's been a lot of good deals still. There's been a lot of liquidity, and there was PPP money that almost anybody could get that went to their lawyer and applied for it. So you had a lot of companies getting PPP money, and then as you were talking about, the landlords were not requiring you to pay rent either statutorily or or in general. So all of it, no one had to do anything. I mean, there were people that were going to file that said, "Hey, we're, we're going to wait to see how this plays out." So. I think we're just at that tipping point where all of a sudden people are saying, hey, is there going to be a new PPP round? Is there going to be three trillion, one trillion? You know, and, and all of a sudden people are starting to be forced because they're getting those notice of defaults from their landlords. They're getting those bank letters. But up until about three weeks ago, we weren't seeing as much. Patrick, how are your clients doing without naming names? <laughs> it depends. You know, I think in the broad bucket, um, a lot of companies are doing fine. Um, and, and some of my clients have had to pivot, like hard pivots and have, have done fine. And some have, you know, in, in a smaller bucket are having trouble. Um, I guess I, I would add kind of on Jim's description of all those alternatives um, that he laid out from my perspective of representing technology companies. Um, I can tell you in the past 10 years, I've only had one company go through a formal bankruptcy. It is fairly rare in my world for that to occur. Um, typically, there are ways to, to sort these things out either through um, an assignment for the benefit of creditors. Those are more common. And then also negotiated kind of settlements. So in, you know, in many ways, when you think about a bankruptcy um, from the legal perspective, and this is how I advise my clients, is that the, the value of a bankruptcy to your board is your board is not trying to put a value to the assets and manage the sale of those assets and expose themselves to liability um, with respect to undervaluing them or making preferential payments to creditors. Um, you can go to the bankruptcy court and say, listen, here's what I got, go sort it out. And the board is not on the hook. If, for example, your stockholders say, hey, you didn't do a good job maximizing the value, you should have sold these assets. So, so in many cases, if you can negotiate and deal with your creditors and come to a, a, a settlement, the liability issue for the board is pretty minimal um, to the extent you, you've done a full disclosure to your creditors and your stakeholders about what's out there, what the outcomes can be, and you can negotiate a settlement, um, which may be a short pay, which may be convert, converting a bunch of debt to equity, and then restructuring the cap table to live to fight to another day with another investor, uh, or some sort of wind down. So Matt, uh, your description of um, you know, going out to all, all of your folks with a, a, a list of like, here's, here's all the debts we have and we want to pay you 10 cents on the dollar. I've had companies do similar, not quite a, in, in as a dramatic fashion as you described, but, but just working the phones and calling all your, you know, your vendors up and saying, guys, this is over in like two weeks, but I, I'll give you 20 bucks now versus the hundred I owe you. And that might, you know, give you some recourse versus what going to a bankruptcy would be zero. Uh, so that type of what, what I would almost call a prepackaged, you know, non-negotiated, or a negotiated bankruptcy or a settlement is more common in my space um, rather than the, the formal bankruptcy process. 
So the clients I have who are having problems are, are really all fall into that bucket right now. They're negotiating with creditors, they're restructuring their cap table, they're trying to raise more money. There is a lot of liquidity. So if the business had, had, had legs six months ago and you can find a story to make it look like there's upside opportunity over the next two to three to five years, there's so money out there. It's just, what's that story? What's the upside opportunity? And can you get people to understand like, hey, I'm gonna lose everything. So I might as well take my $40 million of debt and turn it into some small percentage of equity and see what happens. That's a better outcome for me than just going through bankruptcy and you know, getting a bunch of computers delivered to my front door because I'm a secured creditor and I've got office chairs to sell, which I don't know what to do with. <laughs> well, but we're running a low in time here. Jim, do you want to uh, uh, leave things out with uh, another question or, or, or two or some closing thoughts? The, 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 only thing, the only question we didn't get to, and, well, first of all, and, and I'll throw this out there in case anybody does have any um, feedback on it, is, is, is there any major changes you see coming in healthcare because of, of COVID? And, and from an investment opportunity, are you seeing changes that are taking place in, in this new environment? Remote health is yeah. on fire. Um, you know, we'd seeded a company in 2008 and we're in the wilderness for a while. Um, and it's now just dramatically different. Okay. Yeah, I agree. And the, by well, the way, the docs historically have been the ones trying to kill these plays. And now the docs are going to them and saying, hey, if our offices are closed or we are having challenges, we need you. So try and make certain that however you thread it, it's a win-win for the docs, because if the docs want you dead, you're dead. Interesting. Well, I think, first of all, I want to say, David, thank you and TechFire for having all of us. And I think between Jesse's, Matt, and Patrick's perspective, you, you've really got resources and things. I, I'm sure any of us, you could follow up with questions. But the takeaway I'm getting from hearing Jesse, Matt, and Patrick is have the courage to do something, have the courage to know you're not alone, and that there are resources out there. But that essentially, as I think John Kennedy said, you know, with the, when, when we had the, the moon thing, when Sputnik was launched, he said, throw your backpack over the wall and essentially don't give yourself any excuses. You know, failure is not an option. And so go to your team and, and be vulnerable. And, and, and help let them help you through this. Because I got news for you, we were all talking about this the other day. Everyone's a little fearful right now. This is, this is a, I mean, none of us have lived through a once in a hundred year pandemic, once in a so many years, you know, economic downturn and, you know, political polarization. So you're, you're, you're not alone. And if you share your challenges with people, we'll all get through it together. So thank you all. And um, I, I, I always learn from hearing my panelists. This was great. And uh, thank you all for your time. And, and we, we welcome the opportunity for questions. Great job. Wonderful. Well, yeah. thank you so much to our wonderful panel. Thank you, Jim, for sponsoring. Thank you, Patrick, for sponsoring. And uh, yeah, we're just, uh, we're all in this together. Uh, you know, we all are putting on, uh, you know, our brave face uh, in a you know, precedented time. But, uh, you know, I think this panel has really given us all some uh, you know inspiration to keep going and and Jim uh, okay if I throw out your email uh, it's Jim at cmbginc.com right and Patrick on ending at clapiper.com I won't put Matt and, and Jesse on the spot but I'm sure folks can hunt me down uh, you know and, and follow up uh, on Twitter or what have you but uh, thank you all and uh, you know please know we're we're rooting for all of you uh, we're gonna get through this and get the other side take care thank you. Thank you.